Thanks for tuning in to another look at the NFL season. 2024 is just a couple of days away, and it's time to talk LA Chargers football on the Arlads Football Network. And joining us to talk about the Chargers, Jim Harbaugh, of course, the first year head coach for the LA Chargers. We're going to break down the depth charts. We're going to go over uh, the practice squad candidates, uh, draft picks uh, that we also talked about, of course, with Alex earlier this year. You can check out that interview. That's in the library here on the Orlads Football Network. And uh, anyway, Alex, uh, thanks for joining us once again. And if anybody doesn't know who Alex is, he is the host of Bolts Breakdown, which is part of the Chargers. Uh, actually, it's part of the uh, Guilty as Charged podcast. And also, uh, Alex is a contributor for Chargers Wire. Alex, thanks for doing this. No problem, man. Uh, excited to uh, join back again. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's do this thing. It's it's crazy. Last time I was on after the draft, I feel like, or no, I was on before the draft. It feels like it's been four or five months just went by like that. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about the fact that the Chargers are going to be starting their first year under Jim Harbaugh. So uh, I'm sure the fans just can't wait for the season to kick off. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the end of last season in a lot of ways left uh, a bad taste in some of our mouths, uh, you know, with how things kind of ended in the Staley era. So kind of getting a fresh start, um, you know, some people have higher expectations than others for what this will look like in year one. But uh, Jim Harbaugh has obviously the reputation of being, a, you know, culture rebuilder. You know, first year he goes to every place and seems to have instant success as we've seen with the uh, the Niners, Michigan, all the way back to, you know, his days of uh, Stanford and San Diego, uh, you know. So, yeah, we'll see what he could do uh, in turning this around. Yeah, there are even some fans that may not be as knowledgeable that don't realize that he actually uh, coached the San Francisco 49ers all the way to the Super Bowl. They're, they're, they're kind of yeah. just stuck on Michigan. And right. they don't realize that he had a lot of success, yeah. every not only, like you mentioned, everywhere, but in the NFL as well. So, yeah, um, I, I, that was one of the things when they were first kind of, you know, rumored to hire him. I'm I'm usually a guy that tends to steer away from like the the college coach that like jumps to the NFL. But Jim Harbaugh is like very far from that. Right. Because he has the pro experience from, you know, his time with the Niners and then also has kind of a unique uh, perspective where, you know, he's had all the success, you know, as a player who was, you know, first round pick in the NFL and now has this kind of unique vantage point of coaching both college and pro and having success at it too. Not many people have like the sort of background that he has. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a great prize and it's something that the fan base definitely deserves. And it's been a long time, even when they were, I mean, really you have to kind of go back to the days when I was growing up as a charger fan with Dan Fouts uh, mm -hmm. to really go back to when the fans sort of felt like, you know, Chargers, this is our home in San Diego. You know, every, everything is fine in the world. You know, we're close to winning right. the Super Bowl. And and then ever since that period, it's just been one thing after another, uh, whether it's bad hires or some were good, Schottenheimer and so forth. There's some nice runs there, don't get me wrong. But then mm -hmm. it was always the whole cloud hanging over them as far as moving and all that kind of stuff. And so, and, and even here, I mean, they kind of act like, so, and I, look, I know I'm a jet fan because the jets play with the giants and still you kind of, as a jet fan, we kind of feel like, yeah, but eventually we're going to leave and find our own home. We're not going to stick around mm -hmm. here and be the stepchild to the giants or, you know, for the rest of the, of, of uh, uh, you know, um, uh, our lives. So with the Chargers, I know they're new there. They're not leaving, but still, mm -hmm. Rams win a Super Bowl, and everything just seems like uh, you know we're just a little stepchild. But now they finally, I, I, I believe, knowing how they feel, they must just feel like, all right, this is our time now. It's time for us to finally have ourselves some fun here, watching football games, and feeling like we have a chance to win a Super Bowl. And you know what? You know, this is going to be our home in the next few years. Uh, Sean McVay will retire or go somewhere else, and we're going to be the bosses in L.A. Yeah, well, it would be nice for Sean McVay to retire and go do TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, I think this is the first year where it really feels like, even if it doesn't necessarily translate into wins this year early with what the roster looks like, where they're going in the right direction and, they are building this identity and, and culture. So 
we'll see how all of that pans out, but it, it does feel like significant uh, change in that regard, like you mentioned. Okay, so let's take a look. And, and look, I, I'll be honest with everybody. Last year, I picked the Chargers to win the division because I thought that talent-wise, it was their year. They had everything in place. Uh, and every and, and actually, Ryan Dunleavy of the New York Post has been doing our season preseason predictions. He picked the Chargers to win the two years prior. So we were yeah. like bit, bit, and bit. <laughs> and then this year, I'm going over my predictions, and I'm going, wait a second. I picked the Chargers to win last year. Now they finally have their coach. So why would I not pick them to win this mm -hmm. year? I know that there's some talent, uh, you know, that we'll go over. Uh, as you can see, that receiver situation may not be as pretty as people would like. You know, you you go from, uh, you know, Keenan Allen and, and everybody, and of course Mike Williams, and all, and of, and you lose Eckler, and it's like, oh no. But I honestly just don't think it's that bad. I think that I, I still believe that this is a team that could win this division this year if all goes right. I think the Chiefs could be vulnerable at some point. You know, uh, injuries will creep up to their uh, luck that they've been dealing with there for a while. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. I don't know about you, but let's start with offense. What do you think about? Uh, the overall team and whether or not talent wise, you think they do have a shot to be, if, if Herbert comes through and lives up to everything that we think of him as a really, you know, a, a top tier quarterback that this team could be a really good Super Bowl contender. Yeah. I think, I think this is a big year for Herbert, obviously, like you mentioned, but in a way I, I think almost his stats will look somewhat less impressive than what we've come to expect for Herbert seasons, because I think Greg Roman and Jim Harbaugh are kind of, you know, they're going to want to take the ball out of his hands sometimes, right, and establish this physical ground game. So I almost think that when you're talking about what their ceiling is, and obviously they drafted uh, Joe Alt to play uh, right tackle, I think a lot of it will come down to kind of what that offensive line looks like, particularly given that they don't have a ton of firepower at tight end, at wide receiver compared to some of these other teams. Um, and so, I, you know, Jim Harbaugh's called the offensive line uh, the, the tip of the spear, uh, as he's called them, in terms of, you know, being a weapon for this team. And I really think that will kind of determine how good their offense is to a degree, in addition to Herbert's play, in addition to which receivers step up. Um, I, I really do think a lot rests on you know, because they were not a good offensive line last year, particularly after Corey Lindsley went down. So now you plug Bradley Bozeman in there, you move Trey Pipkins to right guard, bring in Joe Walt. Uh, and I think a lot will hinge on their performance. I don't expect them to necessarily be like a top five offensive line, but if they can be, you know, top 10, top 15, then I think this offense, despite a perceived lack of firepower, could be in a good position. Um, and I do think despite, you know, I, I have some question marks about, you know, Greg Roman and how that'll work. And in 2024, after kind of how he ended with the Ravens, I do think he can construct a good ground game, which is something this team has needed for a while, even with, you know, the success of Eckler, a lot of Eckler's success came in kind of rushing or running in, you know, receiving, but they never, you know, the Chargers were always kind of a bottom 10 team in terms of like, you know, being able to establish that consistent ground game. So I think their hope is offensive line takes a lot of pressure off of Herbert uh, and leads to, you know, uh, a better run game than they've had in recent years. Now the chargers, they picked up Johnson's fifth year option did, or I mean Slater's fifth year option, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And he's obviously right now with Alton Slater, you have really good bookends. You got future bookends that any team would be excited to have. Now, Zion Johnson, unfortunately, has not taken that step yet. Um, but now you've got a different staff, different coaches, different schemes. Maybe this is what will you know trigger uh, his talent because we know it's there being a first round type guy. So, let's just say that that works out because that charges have to hope that works out. Um, do you think Bozeman is a, is, is a, is a solid enough center uh, that they could win with him? Uh, or do you think that, you know, they're probably a couple of more quality offensive linemen away, right guard center, um, which, which, which do you think it is? Do you think it's just right guard or right guard center? Uh, I think long term it can kind of be that you know right guard and center depending on how Pipkins and Bozeman do this year. Um, I, Pip, Pipkins is going to be the 
kind of experiment of this offensive line where, you know, you're switching him from right tackle to right guard. We've heard great things throughout camp, right? Does that actually end up translating uh, on the field? That's going to be uh, certainly an adjustment for him. And then in terms of Bozeman, you know, I think this will be a big year in determining is this kind of a one year rental type of thing, or is this something where, where, you know, he can be the long-term center for a while. Um, I think he played, uh, you know, in a system with the Panthers last year that was not necessarily what, you know, he's great at as a center. And obviously the Panthers offensive line had its own problems last year in protecting Bryce Young, but they kind of wanted to play more of that Frank Reich style of uh, passing football versus this is going to be kind of your Greg Roman smash mouth, take care yeah. of your assignment type football. So I think that does help, you know, and Bozeman from his days at Baltimore does have that familiar familiarity yep. with Roman and, and kind of what they want out of their offensive linemen. So I think even though he didn't have his greatest year last year, I do no. think this is a chance for him uh, to kind of get some of that back, uh, you know, and have one of those seasons that, you know, he's obviously um, in a contract year as well. Uh, so I, I think that'll, you know, be a big motivator for him. And also, you know, I, I think he has the staff as well as the rest of the offensive line around him to kind of, play the style of football that he's more able to play uh, than say the last year in Carolina. Yeah. Uh, that's really all you want. I think when you're taking a look at each, each year in the NFL, because you're, you're look, no, nobody would have predicted what happened to Houston last year. And it happens every year. You get these teams that have these big turnarounds. And, 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 and so, so what you do is you look at the depth chart and you try to say, well, what well, can we, do we have some possibilities? And, and that's, that's all you can ask for. And I think one of the, big issues with the charges is the offensive line, but at least there are possibilities as you just mm -hmm. went through. And so that's all you can hope for, I, you know, especially first year head coach, first year GM, they're trying to do a little bit of a rebuild here, but the charges are not a major rebuild. We know that. Um, mm -hmm. All right. So let's uh, talk about those two. Speaking of Baltimore, there's a lot of Baltimore here. Let's talk yeah. about, it's just funny how Edwards and Dobbins are now in the backfield for the chargers. It just, uh, but it, it's typical. It's like, okay, of course, you know, Jim Harbaugh is here. Uh, Roman's the coordinator. Of course, they're going to have Edwards and Dobbins in the backfield. Uh, Vidal, and I just, just want to talk about Vidal, but let's talk about obviously the top two Dobbins and Edwards. Is do you think Dobbins, uh, and I don't say guess, but do, do you sense that he's going to be healthy enough? You think Edwards will be healthy enough? Do you think these guys can last a full season, especially Dobbins? Everybody's waiting for Dobbins to not play, just play a full season, right? But if, when he plays a full season, to take that next step and be one of the better, you know, dynamic running backs in the league. Yeah. I mean, you look at uh, his per carry numbers from 2020 on, uh, obviously that's four years ago, but you know, he, his rookie campaign was truly uh, one of the better ones we've seen from a running back recently. Um, and so I think that kind of is the hope for him now after an ACL, after an Achilles, right? Uh, the injuries that he's had over the last couple of years, trouble with the knee in 2022 as well. Um, is it possible for him to kind of regain that form? We'll kind of see, um, you know, everything that Dobbins, you know, has said is he feels good. Obviously you can't really predict when a non-contact injury is and isn't going to happen, right? That's kind of luck of the draw um, type stuff. But I do think they've set this backfield up in a way where, you know, you mentioned uh, Kamani Vidal as well. Uh, Harbaugh went for a waiver claim for Michigan's uh, Hassan Haskins, a guy that he really likes uh, as well, uh, obviously from those Michigan days. So I think they've built this to be kind of a, a pretty big physical, you know, backfield that really matches their style more so than what the Chargers had in the past. So. Edwards, uh, you know, did a pretty good job, I think, as bell count last year. I think he played almost all 17 games or at yeah. least 16, 17. Uh, I think he had his highest uh, yards uh, total in a season last yes. year. Five, uh, five point average per carry. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, you kind of take, you know, what Dobbins did back in the day. I think, I think he said for his career, his average has been like 5.4 yards per carry um you take what edwards obviously did last year and you have the ingredients for a pretty good offense assuming the offensive line can uh block up front and i think this is the first year where i feel pretty good about the chargers running back depth that like hey if something does happen to dobbins um i, I honestly do trust kamani vidal uh, based on kind of what he's shown to be able to step up into that role as well haskins is kind of harbaugh's physical pass protector uh, tight back will play a lot of special teams. So I think yep. this is kind of 
ideologically a backfield that is more in tune with what this current coaching regime wants. Yeah, Dobbins actually he he was uh, his average he had averaged his first two years three yards uh, per carry after contact, which is yeah. obviously very strong his first two years, and then the injuries came up. So right. Um, and you mentioned Haskins again, I'm a Michigan fan, as you can see. So, um, I, I remember Haskins, he, Haskins came, he was like the, the guy just before, just before they, they turned it over to Edwards and Quorum and then became that really powerful team. But he, they, they were really still strong running the football with Haskins. You just could tell though, you didn't really know whether or not he was a pro guy, you know, could he be as good in the pros as he was in college? You knew that wasn't the case, but you did feel that he would be a, a serviceable pro. Just hasn't caught on just yet, but maybe this is exactly what he needs, this particular situation. And as you mentioned, he's also underrated as a pretty good special teams player. So um, yeah, I think this is a very exciting backfield to keep an eye on. And you know what, with Herbert, um, the, uh, by the way, uh, Heineke, is he definitely the backup? He's number two? Yeah, I mean, Harbaugh kind of gives quotes that are like, oh, you know, it's a competition between those guys. But I feel like whenever you give up a six-round pick after you just watched a whole preseason of East that Stick, that's <laughs> yeah. less a competition than, you know, they're kind of publicly admitting. But, yeah, I, I do think Heineke, uh, whether it's, you know, I, I guess he just got here. So we'll get up to speed with the playbook a little bit. But I do think the eventual – path as he will be uh qb2 to justin herbert yeah and let's hope we don't see him uh yeah. because just justin herbert you know yeah. when i look when i look at that's this a, that's the funny that's the funny part of the reaction to the trade because it's like oh man this is great we have a sick backup i hope he never plays i hope he never touches the yeah nail. great especially, trade but... <laughs> especially after last year was yeah. that trade by the way was it conditional yeah so i, I believe it's a condition if he plays a certain amount of games or snaps. I don't know exactly what the conditions on it are. Then it becomes a sixth. And if he doesn't play, then it becomes a seventh round pick. I think in, I can't remember if it was 2025 or 2026. Um, but yeah, conditional, conditional sixth round pick. Yeah. Cause when I look at this team too, um, the more I, I, I think about it, I'm like, you know, this, like, let's, let's just say if things go really well, which I expect they will. Baltimore fans are, are probably going to say, well, this is exactly what we were we, we were hoping to get with Jackson is, mm -hmm. yes, we love his athleticism, but we want him to be able to be a good downfield passer. He needs to throw the football properly to be an all-around quarterback. Herbert has that ability. Now, he's not the runner Jackson is. No one is. But Herbert will give the Chargers and Greg Roman that passing game that Greg mm -hmm. Roman did just didn't have with Lamar Jackson. And that's why I think Herbert could be the perfect quarterback for Harbaugh and for Roman. And again, let's remember Greg Roman was the coordinator with Jim Harbaugh when they came this close to winning a Super Bowl with Colin Kaepernick. So, but your point as far as it's 2024 and, you know, it, it, but what I look at it as, Obviously, Harbor is going to want to bring in a guy that he's comfortable with. Yeah. So maybe they get to the playoffs, they get some uh, winning going with this organization. Finally, that's something you got to get in that locker room is a feeling of winning. But then it's up to Harbor to decide at that point, do I feel like I need to bring in someone else to get me over the top? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so. I, I, I totally agree with your sentiment there where I think for year one, year two, as this, you know, kind of rebuild, even though it's not a big rebuild gets underway, then I think Greg Roman is the guy who can kind of build up that physical identity with the run game. It's more, you know, when the chargers eventually are like a consistent playoff contender and they get to that point, you know, is Greg Roman the guy that can kind of get you over the top in terms of, you know, the struggles with some of the passing concepts, which, you know, they hired Marcus Brady, they hired a bunch of other people that are trying to kind of build that with him and Harbaugh really believes in that uh, collaboration. But I think for year one, for the purposes of what Greg Roman is kind of here to do and in, in building out that running game, that, you know, he can be fine for the purposes of it. And like you said, the work with um, Kaepernick, the work with Lamar Jackson, uh, even back to, you know, kind of a case that's a little bit more com uh, comparable to Herbert to some extent and Alex Smith. I think we, you know, he's worked with a wide variety yep. kind of of these quarterbacks. Um, so I, I do think that benefits him in, in coming into this experience. Okay. Now Disley, did, did Disley still end up the highest priced free agent 
to the Chargers this this offseason? Did he? Because he was seven million a year. Because I, <laughs> I, I remember for a while he was their highest price free agent. I don't know if somebody if they signed anyone in the last like two months, maybe last I don't six weeks. Think, I don't think they paid anybody more than that. Because which, which is yeah. just perfect. It's just right. Jim Harbaugh. It's just yeah. Saying, this is gonna they now also, again. They didn't spend a lot of money, yeah. so I they also you know, had to kind of reset their cap in a way. You know, post letting Keenan Allen walk, letting Mike Williams walk, Bosa and Mac back on, you know, uh, pay cut one year deals essentially. Okay. Uh, so they kind of had to <laughs> get under the cap, you yes. know, cause they were like, I don't remember what it was like 25, 30 million over. Uh, so that was, I think, you know, uh, next year, I think the hope is that, Hey, if you have a good, let's say eight to 10 win season next year, then, that puts you in a position to potentially be free agent spenders, uh, you know, in the future, uh, if, you know, they so choose. All right, let's go ahead. But either way, we we know what Disley is and why he's there. And Hurst is a nice flyer. Let's see if we can rejuvenate his career as our number one pass catcher for this position. Yeah. I Um, think that's a, that's a big part of their strategy. You know, you have guys like Hurst, we mentioned Bozeman earlier, uh, even on the defensive side of the ball, they've taken Christian Fulton, right? A lot of these one-year guys who are looking for that career rejuvenation and then potentially they either stay on the team or, you know, um, as in Baltimore, a lot of those guys ended up walking for, you know, bigger contracts elsewhere. And then, the char- you know, the Ravens got compensatory draft picks for them, right? That was like a big part of their MO. So I think that's kind of, you know, considering their cap situation, that's why they gave out a lot of those uh, one-year deal, even uh, DJ Chark, uh, who's sitting uh, at the wide receiver spot right there. So, uh, yeah. By the way, I was looking up the contracts, and Will Disley ended up the top contract. It was three yeah. years, $14 million. Yeah. And number two was uh, Gilman, even though he was, he was you know, just yeah. re-upping. Five and a, five and a, yeah, two, like two at 10.1. Yeah. Yep. And then mm-hmm. Edwidge was the second from the outside at uh, okay. 6.5 over two years. So, yeah, not a lot of money to spend, but I just think it's perfect to see Will Disley yeah. as the number one guy. <laughs> uh, right. And again, Alt as the draft pick. It just makes all the sense in the world if you know Jim Harbaugh. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, let's take a look at that wide receiver room. You mentioned Johnson, of course, didn't make it, uh, but that's uh, not too big a surprise. Brennan Rice did. Uh, it was down to the wire, it sounded like, but made sense. Uh, he's got some talent to keep an eye on. But that that we know why Shark's here. It's, again, sort of like Hurst, but Shark has been uh, you know, a little bit healthier, just a little bit, but he's been healthier and he's been a little bit more productive. But he seems like he's on a team every year. Um, so Palmer looks like he might be the number one veteran uh, since he's here. McConkey is the top draft pick. So the 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 interesting one is, of course, Quentin Johnson. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's got a fresh start, which is always nice after falling on your face as a rookie. You know, some rookies have ups and downs. Other rookies are like, wow, that's I think we made a major mistake here. And that's what kind of season Quentin Johnson had. How did he look this offseason? Yeah, no, I mean, everything um, I would say you've heard from Quentin Johnson's nothing has been terribly negative there are have been moments at camp where he's dropped passes there's also been moments where he's looked really good on some days and caught five to six i like to me it's a situation you're just not going to know until until the season starts and you're in those high pressure cooker situations right um and it's forced to kind of either live up to the moment and address you know the drop issues and a lot of the stuff he got you know uh hit with last year or you know um kind of crumble under the pressure there's you know two ways that can go but i think they have put themselves in a position by drafting mcconkey obviously like you mentioned taking a flyer on chark um and having josh palmer to the point where it's kind of you know free real estate in the wide receiver room for whoever wants to yeah uh, but right you know because i think in previous years you would just book in okay well keenan is going to have 90 to 100 catches. Mike Williams is going to have so-and-so catches, assuming he can stay healthy, right? So you kind of had that uh, thought process in the back of your head, like trying to do these predictions. But if you're trying to like predict yards and touchdowns this year, particularly if you're playing fantasy or doing anything else, 
it's so hard, <laughs> you know, um, I think in trying to uh, really kind of lay this out, I think Palmer will certainly start as your wide receiver one, but obviously McConkey, you know, Herbert has loved uh, those guys who can kind of play the slot and the outside sort of like Keenan did uh, back in the day. Obviously Chark is here, so you're probably primary X receiver, I would guess, on day one. And then we'll see, you know, where Johnson was. Um, I think it was Greg Roman who talked about the offense being, you know, a meritocracy, right? Basically, whoever steps up, steps up, right? And they don't have, you know, a single receiver who's like, oh, this is my contract, so I'm entitled to this amount sure. of catches, I'm entitled to this amount of yards. So I really do think from their perspective, um, it's about seeing, you know, who kind of rises to the top uh, in that regard. Yeah, and again, look, this could be one of those things where if the Chargers have a seven-win season, a lot of that is going to have to do with the fact that you know, McConkey's just a rookie. None of these guys show anything. Quentin Johnson, uh, forget him, uh, and that's just the type of season it is. But again, there are possibilities, and there are some talented players in that room, and you do yeah. have a talented quarterback, and you do have a talented coaching staff. So, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. But give me a guess on who you think is going to end up as the number one receiver. Like if I if I had a, to bet on the safest one, it would probably be Josh Palmer. Okay, but I also think he, Palmer's had some injury concerns, certainly like during camp and in previous seasons. Um, I kind of I kind of like the McConkey bet a little bit, but again, he's a guy that also sort of like Palmer has had his fair share of injury concerns as well. So that's another <laughs> issue that sort of adds to the uncertainty. Um, but I, I would go, I would go Josh Palmer if I had to, you know, bet who's going to lead the wide receiver room has had, you know, some pretty quiet 700, 800 yard seasons yeah. where like he's come close uh, in spots where Keenan Allen and Mike Williams have been out to actually, you know, hitting a thousand yards. So I don't know if he's going to necessarily hit that in this offense where it's kind of going to be spread out around a bunch of guys. Um, but I think he certainly also brings in the most established instant chemistry with Justin Herbert as well. And then uh, of course that could all change in week one. If Quentin Johnson goes five, uh, 150 and two touchdowns. Right. Uh, so yeah. Uh, but like you said, we'll find out uh, when the real bullets start flying on mm -hmm. Sunday uh, games on Sunday, by the way, what is it? Yep. A four o'clock game. Something like that. Uh, Eastern time. Four o'clock window. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, by the way, Darius Davis, is he just a returner? No, I, I think Darius Davis is also going to be involved as well. Uh, okay. I think they started one of their preseason games. I think it was their last one against Dallas. Uh, he actually basically uh, took a you know reverse sweep and <laughs> ran it all the way uh, back to the end zone, <laughs> basically 65 yard return, you know, on his first play. Uh, so I think they have plans to utilize him. I don't know if he's going to be an every down player because you obviously talk about the new kickoff rule and all that will be on the returners for both, you know, kicks and punts. So I don't know if you want Darius Davis playing that much, uh, considering the new rules and how important kickoffs and punt returns are. But I think if they have their chances, uh, to utilize him, you know, there's not, a ton of speed in their wide receiver room. So I do think if you want one of those guys who, you know, can get open or break open a play here, uh, that's a big one for the offense. He certainly is uh, the catalyst to potentially having some of those big, you know, 30, 40, 50 yard plays, uh, you know, with his, with his speed. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, good to have someone dangerous like that uh, yeah. out on the field that uh, gives the defense something to be concerned about. All right, yeah. let's talk defense now. And Khalil Mack, I mean, uh, you know, I actually, a couple of years prior, you know, I, I was pretty critical of Mack myself because I was like, well, you know, he's getting all this money, and uh, which is nice for him and all this. And he's, I know he does a lot of the sort of like uh, what I would be saying about my, my, my linebacker, CJ Mosley, is. Okay, I understand how important he is. He's a leader and all that, but he's not as good as everybody's saying. He's not making game-changing plays, and I just think it's a little bit overhyped uh, of his value, um, even though I understand it. But Mac last year, boy, did he just finally, in my mind, that's the kind of Khalil Mac I was expecting to see every year here. 
since, you know, or really every year since he's became, you know, uh, as rich as he became, but look how old he is now. So how many more years can he give those types of seasons? And then of course you have Bosa, uh, he's starting to get up there in age as well. So this is like a very, this is why I think this is a window for the chargers that they can't be thinking about three or four years down the road. They got to be thinking, Hey, how can we win as quickly as possible when we got these two guys that really are still playing pretty you know, at the you know again, they're not in the prime of their careers, but they're still showing it from time to time. So if these guys stay healthy, what do you think the Chargers can do on defense? Yeah, I, I think that's actually the biggest variable for the defensive line, um, because in terms of the interior of the defensive line, I don't know if the Chargers have a lot to be able to contend with there. Um, but if you have Mac and Bosa both healthy for 17 games, which is you know the vision that they sort of traded for you know when they were initially acquired mac back in 2022 um you know that is one of the best edge rusher duos in the league getting there is another story right in terms of you know uh, a 17 game season and so you know joey bosa I, I think broke his hand uh in training camp he's already back he's you know going to play week one um but unfortunately it's been kind of a nightmare of injuries from year to year for him and so I, when he does play, and I think this was a stat uh, I saw the other day where uh, when Joey Bosa, Khalil Mack, and Tui Tui Pelotu, uh, their rookie second round pick last year, were on the field for 44 plays, they had 10 sacks, <laughs> right, um, you know, combined on those plays. And so it's, it's about that small sample size that's looked really good, but can you get more of it sustained throughout a season? And I think that's really kind of the story um in the edge room so i think again if you can get i'm not expecting 16 17 games from mac and bosa but if you can get them both to play uh 13 to 14 right each, oh yeah uh, i i think that that is like sort of the goal particularly with a 34 year old Glenn mac who might need some kind of management of his snaps and then obviously bosa um you know with his uh, injury history so that i think is kind of the goal uh, in seeing that. And then, you know, their futures are kind of up in the air, I would say, in terms of how long they're going to be with the Chargers. Um, so th this this is a big year for both of them. And they both, you know, kind of wanted to come back under, under Jim Harbaugh as well. Um, so, you know, we'll see what happens. But I think they're the biggest variable to sort of unlocking this defense because I don't know how much talent is really there throughout the rest of it. But Jesse Winter... If you have, you know, those four edge rushers in Bosa, Mac, um, Tui Pelotu, and Bud Dupree, who they picked up uh, as well in free agency, then I kind of think this is, you know, a pretty solid group. It's just a matter of how long they're out there for. Well, you mentioned Tui Pelotu. So is he, do you think, based on what you saw last year, that, yeah, I mean, if this defense is going to do really well, he, I think he's ready to take that next step. Yeah, I, I think he's ready to take that next step too. And he gives you, you know, flexibility in terms of how you want to play. Uh, you know, Bosa and Mac, there was a play I remember um, in the preseason where they kicked to uh, Tuli Tui Pelotu inside and then had those two, Bosa and Mac didn't play in the preseason, but they had two edge rushers kind of flare out. All three of them got pressure on the play. And you imagine that in the regular season where, you know, you have Bosa and Mac rushing on the outside kick Tully, Tully below to inside, right, uh, yeah. and do stuff like that. So I think there's some fun uh, pressure packages in general that Jesse Minter can kind of draw up with those four guys uh, and have packages where you have two, three, or four of them, you know, on the field at the same time. Uh, so I think that that is, is kind of the goal for this, this edge room, uh, you know, assuming they can stay healthy. All right, now let's talk about, to me – this is the big, this is my biggest question is, is the run mm. defense. Yeah. Is, and you mentioned that defensive line, no question that uh, now maybe they, they're, they're, maybe they got one piece with their fourth round pick, but they still have a few more to go. Um, but any chance now I know um, uh, Egbonia now he's really hasn't played a whole lot the last couple of years. So he's still kind of a mystery. What do you give me? Best case scenario with that. I think the best, line. best case scenario is 
uh, Aguanya honestly looked really good uh, in the preseason last year. You know, he was still coming back from his uh, knee injury previously. Um, but I thought he looked really good in the preseason. And then, you know, you have Morgan Fox, who's a really great situational pass rusher. He's yeah. never going to be an every down player um, because of the run defense, but he's a good pass rusher when he's asked to do so. Um, you know, I think it really hinges a lot on Puna Ford in particular. Um, you know, obviously he didn't play a ton in Buffalo last year. Um, if he can get back to the Puna four that we saw in 2020 and 2021, then, you know, you could start talking, having some conversations about this defensive line that, uh, you know, are really dynamic in terms of how they use the edge rushers with that, uh, defensive line as well. But, you know, big if, right. What big if, right. What's the likelihood of that? So I kind of peg him as the key variable uh i guess for this team is you know since we didn't see him play a lot last year you know what does he look like kind of in this system um in another i guess uh comeback bid where he will be one of the team's top starters so um yeah i i would say ford is kind of the one that i think can either push this you know defense forward a little bit or you know if you know the signs of age or there or he's just not quite what he used to be when he was in seattle um then that can make life harder for the defensive line as well now matlock was a pick from uh the former regime in the sixth round yeah. so he's still a young kid and then again i mentioned uh the fourth round pick so Definitely, yeah. talk a little bit about whether or not there's some hope there yeah, no, I mean Harbaugh Harbaugh really loves uh Scott Matlock and I think he'll he'll play a lot of snaps. Uh from watching him in the preseason and last season. I don't love him as much as Harbaugh <laughs> does, but um, you know, we'll we'll kind of see what he is. Uh, I think, yeah, like you mentioned, I, I think run defense and pass rush are kind of the real like key factors here for like which ones you're gonna play. So Matlock will get that opportunity simply because the Chargers don't have a ton of those bodies, but um, I'm I'm curious, I guess, in, in terms of him, how much the coaching staff like really loves him versus how much he's just kind of a guy that's in the room, <laughs> um, you know, in a year where you don't have a ton of, uh, you know, force up there. But we'll see. Um, I, he certainly has impressed the coaching staff up to this point. We'll see how much that translates kind of in the regular season. And uh, the fourth round pick? Yeah, um, it, it would be didn't play a whole lot in the preseason training camp. He, you know, suffered uh, an injury. So he's kind of going to be one of those guys that I think has to kind of work his way uh, back in. Um, but, you know, they, they have hope for him. Obviously played a lot of that um, tweener edge interior at Alabama. And I think they, they have hope that, you know, if he kind of makes it back this year that he can contribute. Uh, right now, I don't think he's on the path to playing significant snaps year one, but you know, that could all, all change with, you know, one performance or one injury, uh, from one of the top guys. So, uh, the interior, as far as the linebacking game looks like there's potential again, you've got a third round pick from last year. You got a third round pick from this year who played uh, under Minter and you've got a veteran. So, um, talk about, uh, that you know, that, that threesome there that looks like it's, uh, you know, pretty good. Yeah. I think if you're talking about most improved group, uh, from one year to another, I think it is this linebacker group. Um, I think Perriman is kind of your physical thumper in the run game. He's been there, done that, um, you know, uh, in, in the league for a while. I think he's very efficient at what he does. And then you have Henley and Colson, who I think are two guys that have a lot of high athletic upside and in Minter's defense in particular, uh, a lot of upside coverage skills as well. Uh, so this is a linebacker group that I actually really like uh, from last year. Nick Neiman is on IR. So at some point he'll be back. Um, but this is a group that I think has the chance to probably make the biggest leap from last year uh, in terms of the production uh they were getting previously so uh, i'm i'm personally really excited to watch this group and i think when you talk about run defense uh three guys that you know both in college and in the pros um i i think have lived up to uh the hype of you know being good tacklers as well versus uh, i think they really kind of have sacrificed that uh in the linebacker room in previous years so uh definitely a room that uh, i'm excited to watch 
And then we wrap up with the secondary. So the secondary has talent, but there's yeah. also a few questions. But overall, what do you think? And I got two rookies from the fifth round. So uh, what do you think uh, about the secondary? Yeah, right now, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, you have Derwin and Alohi, who I think uh, are, are very proven, you know, have all the confidence in the world in them. Outside of that, you know, Asante's obviously been here a while. He's going to be one of your starting outside corners. Outside of that, it's a little bit of a mystery right now. I think you have Bolton, who is going to project to start uh, from day one. Taylor is obviously your starting slot corner as well. And then they just traded from uh, for Elijah Molden from Tennessee, who was a guy that I was high coming out of the draft on. Uh, and now they have two of the Tennessee corners from recent years uh, in Fulton and Elijah Molden. So I guess uh, Jesse Mitchell <laughs> liked what he saw in film there. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think this is a room that has a lot of potential uh, and it, it'll kind of be, I, I think there will be some moments where they kind of are working at the kinks, but really the defensive line is getting the pressure that it's supposed to get with, you know, Bosa, Mack and that top edge rushing presence. And I think that makes the, the lives of the secondary a little bit easier as well, uh, or at least I think that's sort of, you know, the theory behind it. So, um, you know, I, th I think Elijah Molden trading for him a week before the season, that's a little bit of the wild card here in terms of how much he ends up playing. Okay. Um, and where? Uh, you know, that's a question too. I, I think he he's played a little bit at slot and at safety, you know, uh, previously in Tennessee. I don't think he's going to be the starting slot corner day one after just getting here. But sure. what is that eventual? What is that eventual role they try to work him into? Uh, I think that's kind of that's kind of the question uh, there. Okay, and then Fulton at least is coming off what it appeared to be his best season last year. So there's that. Taylor, on the other hand uh he hasn't really put it together yet so that's uh yeah is there any chance that either of those fifth round rookies gonna see any playing time as well uh i i would say maybe with you know i, I think those are more kind of injuries like if they if something happens to the top line then those okay. guys get put in um but you know i think those are more you know uh tarheeb and camp Hart are more future projects depending on what happens kind of in the off season uh this year uh with Fulton and Asante, uh, who are both, I think, on expiring uh, contracts. So, you know, it could be a lot of reshuffling in the quarterback room come uh, next season. Do you believe in Taylor at all? Yeah, I, I, I believe him to be sort of a competent, you know, like innings eater. I, I don't know if he's a, you know, lockdown slot corner, sort of, you know, like yeah. the Jets have and, and Michael Carter. Uh, but, you know, I think he's a guy that can, you know, uh, be sustainable enough if you're depending on the matchup. But I also think there are going to be times where it's like, okay, you know, there's a, you know, really tough slot matchup one week, you know, we kind of have to, you know, shuffle around what we do yeah. here in the quarterback room. So I, I think it's a little bit matchup dependent as well, but um, he's a guy who, you know, has obviously stuck on from the previous regime. So I, I think the new coaching staff likes what they see from him. Um, just a matter of kind of like you said, putting it together. All right. And then by the way, the special teams is really good. Uh, they kept their special teams coach. So mm -hmm. um, that shows you how good they are. Uh, we know Dicker, who, by the way, I just picked up uh, in my uh, year to year league uh, this uh, a couple days ago. So he's my kicker. So I'm happy about that. <laughs> uh, but Darius Davis, we know how explosive he is. Um, everything is good here, right? Is, is there any questions? No, I, I think special teams is the one area of this team where I, I really don't have any questions uh, about in any way. Um, you know, Ryan Ficken, obviously, you mentioned uh, coming back. I think he's had a top 10 special teams each of the last two years um, that he's been the special teams coordinator. Uh, starts with, you know, Cameron Dicker, who obviously they've gotten a great performance out of and, and just extended, uh, you know, four more years. Uh, J.K. Scott has been a really good punter for them. And then, yeah, Darius Davis, I think. Excited to see kind of what he can do uh, with the new kickoff rules and, and how that's going to uh, end up working out. And I think they expect him to kind of put in some positive uh, field positions as well. So this is the one area of the Chargers that I think is going to be kind of rock solid. Uh, and they have a lot of guys on the team, Brendan Rice and Simi Pahoko, some of those guys who are at the you know bottom of the wide receiver depth chart as well, who uh, I think are going to kind of get a lot of work uh, in a special teams capacity as well. 
Um, so, you know, some of the guys who are on this practice squad here, uh, including Jalen Johnson, um, he's another guy that I expect to play some special teams uh, throughout the year. So they they really um, gotten that culture together, I think, in terms of just having guys that are able to be some consistent special teams uh, contributors from year to year, in addition to the top line kicker, punter and, and, and punt returner you know, positions. Uh, I think they also have some guys in special teams coverage that uh, are pretty good, too. Yeah, it's uh, it's it, it can make the difference between whether yeah. the Chargers are a playoff team or not, considering there's a lot of questions on the team. So yeah. uh, that's one part that's not. By the way, is uh, are there any players on the practice squad that can contribute for the offense or the defense this year? Yeah, I, I think Tony Jefferson uh, is going to play a lot. Uh, he obviously came out of retirement, um, you know, made the team initially in terms of the 53 man roster, but because uh, he is a 10 year NFL veteran, I think the rules with the practice squad work a little bit differently where he doesn't have to go through waivers and getting claimed by another team. So he can basically be elevated to the roster and then resign to the practice squad. So I think he's going to play in a lot of games this year. Um, I, I certainly have that expectation. And then, um, I'd say Shaq Quarterman is a guy at linebacker who uh, is probably going to get some playing time, certainly early uh, with Nick Neiman injured. Uh, and I think he's going to contribute uh, on special teams a lot. So I, I would kind of peg those as the two, but definitely uh, Tony Jefferson uh, is going to get a lot of playing time, I think. All right. And he is a uh, Neiman, as you mentioned down there. So he would be the most significant player on IR. Yeah, every everyone else other than Neiman is on season-ending IR, uh, right. so he has the potential to uh, come back. So I think he's, from a special teams perspective, and obviously just depth in the linebacker room right now, because right now they only have four linebackers, um, you know, getting him back is definitely high priority for them at some point. Alex, uh, I gave you my prediction at the start, so what's your prediction? Are the Chargers a playoff team? I'll say nine and eight undecided on if they're a playoff team i'm not fully i i think the afc is really tough i think yeah. if this was a team that was in the nfc it would be a little easier to predict like a jim harbaugh turnaround um where they're in their year one like i said i think there's some offensive and defensive questions that are going to get answered throughout the year but you know if you start well early i think that's something that'll benefit them later on and you know they start with the raiders steelers and the panthers not saying any of those games are easy no, um, but you know, any given Sunday as always, but I think that, you know, if you can go two and one in those games, then I think you certainly give yourself some momentum going into the chiefs game. Right. And I think it's about setting up some of that momentum for later in the season when their schedule actually gets pretty difficult later on. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm kind of at nine and eight this year. I think Jim Harbaugh certainly could be in some of those coach of the year conversations, you know, at some point, if he gets his team to be, you know, a nine, 10, 11 win team. Um, but yeah, I, I still just have to see the offense play out, you know, in actuality now. And I'm thankful I don't have to watch preseason football anymore. <laughs> Excited to see, you know, the real thing with Herbert on the field. Um, I, I think it has a chance to certainly, you know, be a special kind of return to form like we were talking about uh, in previous years, uh, you know, uh, earlier in the show. Sure. Uh, and by the way, uh, Herbert, is he, I mean, you have any doubt that he's ready to go and that there's any link that there will be any lingering issues. Yeah, no, I mean, he's been out of the boot. He's been practicing normally. Seems like everything's fine. You know, obviously we'll kind of see what his mobility is in that first game. Uh, you know, if there's anything Greg Roman's able to do there, or if they're a little bit more cautious with how they use him in any like particular running game, um, but everything outside of uh, everything from camp, or at least, or from practices is positive so far. Alex, great job. Thank you very much in uh, getting me up to speed on this uh, football team, the Chargers this year with Jim Harbaugh, my former coach. And a <laughs> lot of uh, not only are the Chargers fans excited, I'm excited to see how he coaches this, uh, this organization. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. He's got himself a quarterback. He's got some uh, players there to work with. So, 
Uh, we'll find out if it's a quick one or if it takes them a year or two. But uh, again, bottom line is it's going to happen. It just does. Yeah. Jim Harbaugh is a winning coach. It's just, you know, that's what's so awesome about hiring guys like that. And they're so far and few between because you know they're worth the money. They're, 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 there's only like a handful of those guys that are worth the money. You're buying to get your franchise to the postseason and hopefully even more. And uh, it's great that this organization finally will uh, will hopefully have some luck on their side. So 